people are still working on them, I know. As I said, it's not a, uh, you know, I'm not keen on the deadlines. People ask me, can I do it Tuesday instead? I said, sure. Wednesday instead, I said, sure. Nobody asked me for Thursday or Friday, so I didn't say anything to that yet. Um, there'll be one more honest problem. So let's do a quick recap on what's the plan. The end is near, so what's our plan? Schedule today occurrences and Fibonacci and this week Wednesday no, Thursday squeeze <coughs> Friday Rats. Homework 10 is due not a week from today, but two weeks from today, right? That's uh, 12, I think 12, 3, that's the last day of classes. Um, next week, this class on Tuesday. But after that, nothing else. There's a class, one more class, last class. 12-3. Then that week, 12-4 is an optional recitation. With all students. Because Thursday, that's a Wednesday. Thursday, 12.5, there's nothing. <coughs> this is optional, and it's going to be not related to exam. You can expect, you know, start from. So, uh, the, we'll do the three recitation on Wednesdays. People from Wednesday should come to their session. People from Thursday should come on Wednesday to any session they like, if they have time, preferably the same time slot. Uh, I don't know how many seats are in those rooms. We'll make it work somehow. Remember, those are super hard problems and not related to exam. If you miss this recitation, they're not going to impact your brain in any way. Okay? Those will be the start problems from the paper you have. Uh, Monday, 12-9, exam review. That's probably three hours. Uh, optional, of course. To be a discussion about the exam. I don't have a time yet. That's up to the registrar to give us a room and a time. And the registrar, so nice with us, moved the exam again back to the 10th. So what's the 10th? They move it, they move it again. I hope it's going to stay on the 10th, right? Let's see. That's the final. 3.30 to 5.30. Uh, that's not in my power to decide the exams. That's the registrar. So for everybody who asked me, hey, what happened to my flight? Because it moved to the 12th, there's no issue now. It's back to the 10th, right? That's our plan. So uh, where were we with recurrences? Here's a recurrence we've seen quite a few times already. Uh, T of n is 4, T of n by 2 plus n. I showed you this one twice already. Um, and I, I said four recurrences, they're usually two things. One is to push it out grinding until you get an answer. And we did this last time. We do this one and three other recurrences at the end of the lecture. And we just expanding and expanding and expanding. We'll do one or two of those more today. Uh, by expanding, I mean so iteration. I'm not going to rewrite it because you already have it in your notes. Mm -hmm. Is to say equal four. I put a big square bracket and I expand t of n by two. So that would be four t of n by 
4 plus n by 2, right? And if I keep doing this, eventually I get some, you know, uh, k pattern. The general k. This is how this looks. And then the finish, which is last thing. Typically, that we call that the iteration method. And anybody remember what did we get here? How much is this? Now, if this is clean, the ones, the three ones that we saw in class last time, they were, I called them clean. They were clear enough. That we can just stop here and say this, this, this do this, take off. The other way to stack recurrences is to somehow guess this. Nobody will ask you how you guessed it. Guessing it's, you know, everybody can guess it. And then prove by induction. By induction, this is not a proof by induction. This is just grinding it out until I get an answer. It has to be math clean, like the steps have to be clearly, you can't just say, I'm guessing that formula is no more than n log n. That kind of thing is not clean. But the ones I showed in class, they were clean enough, you can just leave it at that. Now, if by induction, I don't have to do this. I can just guess n square, but then I have to prove it. So that proof by induction was, you want to end up with C2 n square, C1 n square. But what is the premise here? The premise always depends on the actual recurrence. If the recurrence depends on 4 t of n by 2, then the induction hypothesis would be on t of n by 2. Because that's how we relate the new guy with the old guy. Right? So then that proof that we did last time was this is C2 n by 2 square. C1 and by 2 squared. Did we prove this thing? I think we did. Did we? I think we started the recitation with the induction proof, assuming we have the guess. And uh, we did a few of those. I want you to clearly make a distinct, distinct uh, distinction here between grinding it out to the answer that's good in particular when you don't know the answer. When you know the answer, n squared, then it might be easier to do a proof by induction if this part is messy. But the disadvantage here is that if you get the wrong guess, instead of n squared, you try n log n, some of the proofs will work. n log n squared log n might work as an upper bound, but not as a lower bound. And n log n might be a good lower bound, but not a good upper bound. So this might be a, a, a massive waste of time and energy if you don't have what you guess. On the other hand here, you don't need a guess to do this. This ends up with the geometric series, typically, and you solve it out. And if you're careful with your math, you might get a good answer. Even if it's not super clean, the chances are this way you get the good answer. So it's pretty much a balancing game between when do I know my guess is good, I can count on it, and how clean this can be. If this is an easy, clean thing with a you know, reasonable answer, that's good. If I have a good guess on the other side, but I can't finish this, there's some monsters there, then maybe I switch to induction proof. That, that's, that's always, you know, kind of a trade-off of how well this goes. Question? Yes, so I uh, a dumb question for you. Uh, do you remember, I think, two or three lectures ago, you said the regular sections were doing only big ones, right? <laughs> so I was wondering, on our final, let's say I make uh, the wrong guess, and then I do it by induction, and I can only prove big O, right? About maybe would I lose like all the points of the entire problem? Uh, I think I convinced the regular section to do data yesterday. So did that answer the question? Yeah. I said like, okay, guys, let's do data because all these recurrences are data bounds. We can answer exactly both lower bound and upper bound. There will be harder questions in your algorithms class. That will be quite hard to do one of the bounds. And then you leave it lower bound n squared, upper bound n squared log n. But for now, if you can do a theta bound, exam or not, do a theta bound. Now, if you cannot, having two bounds that are not the same, omega of you know n log n and o big O of n squared, that's much better than not solving the problem. So if you end up in that situation where I'm not sure I can prove the same bound. This is the tightest bound you can have, n squared on both sides or n log n on both sides, because that's asymptotically exactly n log n. If you cannot do that, 
still having two bounds close enough, n squared and n squared log n, let's say, you know, it's reasonable. I don't think uh, this would be a particular difficult problem to exam because I have other things in mind that are quite interesting. <laughs> Back to counting. I, I told you already, I'm going to push in the exam counting because the other instructions are going to push the later material, but I want everyone to recap counting. So if you see a hard problem in the exam, made by me, it's going to be on counting. All right, so we actually didn't prove this. We started the proofs both ways, and we succeeded on one and failed on one. You guys remember that? Which one did we succeed? The lower. The lower. <coughs> we say, that's the lower bound here. That's the upper bound. That's the lower bound, upper bound. And we succeeded in the proof of the lower bound. I'm not going to do the proof again, but I'll do the induction step. If c1 n by 2 squared is smaller than t of n by 2, then c1 n squared is smaller than t of n. And like always, you know, things that they might be not be true in the very beginning for n equal 1, might start at some point 2 or 3 or 5. So those order of growth asymptotes, we're not concerned with the behavior when n is small. We concern with how they grow to infinity. So the fact that this may not happen for n equal 1 or 2 or 3, it only happens starting at n equal 10, that's totally fine. We don't care about the beginning. When somebody says order of growth, they mean the behavior towards plus infinity. It doesn't matter the beginning of the sequence. So we did that, right? Done. Then we tried, this is the lower bound, we tried upper bound that is uh, t of n by 2 bigger than c2 n uh, by 2 squared. implies uh, t of n is more than c2 n squared, fail. And at that point, because we tried the mechanics of it, we couldn't do it, right? Remember? Hands up who remembers that. That we tried this, and when we tried to simplify the terms, clearly it didn't work. But then we said, there's two ways for why this is failed. One way is my proof technique is not good enough. There's some more sophisticated proof that's needed here. This idea is just no good. But the other reason why things might fail is that this recurrence may not be upper bounded by n squared. Maybe it's bigger than n squared. Of course, if it's bigger than n squared, I could never prove an upper bound of n squared. So we tried upper bound. Remember what we tried? n cube. Did that work? That worked. So t of n by 2 smaller than c2 n by 2 cube implies t of n by c2 n cube works. So what we prove if we stop here will be like, OK, out of this, we got t of n to be between uh, you know, o of n cube and omega of n squared. It's at least n squared and most n cube. That's not a tight bound because it's not the same function. That's why it's not theta. Oh, everybody good with that? That's all just to recap what happened with this particular exercise in the last two or three lectures. Now, because we've done this last time, though, now we know it's n squared. Because we've got a clean derivation that's n squared. So that doesn't contradict the NQ bound, right? The fact that we know it's asymptotically n squared, it doesn't make this any weird, does it? We just proved that something that's n squared, it's upper bound by a cube. That's totally normal. But how do we do this? Well, back, back to the first step induction, I still want to do this. So here's an idea. Again, proof upper bound n squared by induction. Take two. I'm going to say, here's the proof, t of n is uh, 4 t of n by 2 plus n, uh, which is smaller than 4 c2 n by 2 squared plus n. That's obviously the induction hypothesis, right? This two, t of n by 2 is smaller than that. I know that from the induction hypothesis. 
This, if I open parentheses, which you already did last time, it's C2n squared plus n. Right? And I'm going to say this is now O of n squared, which is smaller than C2 n squared. Is that true? Is that correct? So I'm kind of trying to do the same proof we tried last time, but I'm introducing this idea that if this guy is like n squared plus n, <coughs> effectively that's n squared, and that's smaller than C2 n squared. That, that fly? I have it here, my notes. From the algorithm's class. This is no good, right? But we, we tried this, I mean, we got up to here, remember? When we, and we say, okay, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. What exactly is wrong here? <coughs> if somebody does such a proof, <coughs> what is the part that is incorrect? <coughs> it is, all the steps are true, right? This is equal to that, that's true. This is this all of n squared? Of course it is. This is a polynomial of n squared. Whatever this C2 value is, it's a constant. This thing here, it's upper bounded by O of n squared. Everybody sees that? This is a second degree polynomial. Doesn't matter what its coefficient is. Is this true if I have something of n squared that's smaller than some constant of n squared? Yes, it's true. Every single step here, it's true in principle, except one little problem. Uh, the a big O of n squared uses C2 of n, and so you can't say that C2 of n is big. See, you can't say that C2 is bigger than the C2 that you use to make the O squared. Specifically, I think what you mean is this is true, but this O has a constant in it. For something to be O of n squared, it has a constant. That constant dn squared, it's not necessarily this C2. It's a different constant. That's what the problem is. Every single step is correct, except this constant here compared to all, it's not the same constant. You can have the same C2 constant. Because if you look at this part and C part, this is clearly false. So if you take every step separately, you say this is all of n squared, that is true. All of n squared is more than a constant of n squared, that is true. But this constant is not the same as this constant. It's a different constant. So for this process to work mechanically, every induction step from 1 to 2, from 2 to 4, from 5 to 10, right? Every induction step jumps from n by 2 to n. <coughs> for this to work, if you look at all those steps, every time it moves from n by 2 to n, it has to increase the constant. If C2 was, you know, 2, then the next C2 will have to be 3. And then when it jumps again from 10 to 20, that C2 will have to be 13. And then the next C2. So for this to work, this C2 cannot be a constant. It will always have to increase little by little. Hands up. Is that allowed to increase C2? No. A constant can be chosen, any constant you want, but only once. Once you pick a C2, you can't change it. For this brief to work, C2 is not a constant here. Well, again, intuitively, if you grade this step by step, you can fool somebody because every step makes sense. But the fact that this is the same constant like this does. OK, so that didn't work. Uh, let's try something that works. Huh? I still want an induction proof for that statement. But I'm going to make a stronger statement. We had one of these examples. I show you inequality, some bunch of terms that were smaller than 2. And I said, we can't really prove smaller than 2. But if we prove smaller than 2 minus 1 over n, then we can make it work. Remember that one? It was in your notes was written on the board, we said inequality, a bunch of stuff sum up, all is more than two. 
clearly that's not a strong enough induction statement because once you add something, that two cannot remain a two. But if you prove it's smaller than two, it will. So the same thing we're gonna do here, we're gonna say if t of n by two is smaller than c2 n by two squared <coughs> minus d n by two, so I'm adding this, this term here. I make that inequality stronger. It's not just smaller than C2n by 2 squared. It's smaller than something smaller than that. Then, P of n, it's smaller than Cn squared minus dn. Of course, this has to be a correct induction step. Whatever is written here in n has to be here in n over 2. That is the same as all the principles. Action. And n over 2, like in there, it's because the recurrence is in n over 2, I use n over 2. The difference between this and the top one is that the statement here is stronger. Now, clearly, if I prove this, <coughs> I prove that too, right? If it's smaller than this, this is smaller than that. Right? Cn squared minus dn, it's smaller than c2. c2 n squared. So would this proof work? Let's try. T of n is 4 T of n by 2 plus n. By induction hypothesis, this is smaller than C2 n over 2 squared minus C n by 2 plus n, right? I use the induction hypothesis on T n over 2. It's smaller than this n. Now that is equal to what if I open parentheses? C2 n squared <coughs> minus 2d n plus n. Uh, and now I put my one here. What do I want this to be smaller than? So that's what I know. This is induction hypothesis. And now I manipulate the term 4 with the 4 goes away. I get C2n squared. 4 times 2, 4 divided by 2 is this 2, dn plus n. And now what do I want to be this smaller than what? How much? Somebody loud. Minus dn. That's what I want. So again, I like to make a difference between what I know and what I want. Now let's see how this works out. This goes away with this, right? And then if I move those <coughs> dn's around, I get n smaller than 2 dn minus dn. Divide by n in here, 1 smaller than d. Is that true? So like always, this will tell me what kind of D I need to make this work. If you remember when we tried this the first time, we concluded there is no C2 that can do it. We tried, we did the algebra, and then we ended up removing all the C2s. We got n smaller than 0. We, we can't pick a C2 to make that work. But in here, if I make D bigger than 1, can I revert this proof and say, OK, it's going to work? Say I choose. I can choose, for example, d equal 1.5. Remember, constants I can choose once. My point is, if I choose d bigger than 1, then this is going to be true. Everybody sees how I got from here to here? 2 oranges minus 1 orange is 1 dn, and then divide by n. Then this is going to work, that's going to work. This is the same idea we did for that inequality. There was a bunch of terms smaller than two. Since that's too hard to prove by induction, but instead we're gonna prove something stronger that we can control with the induction. This dn here helps the problem that we had the first time on this proof. We can make it work for a certain degree. So that sometimes it's a good trick to know. Sometimes when induction proof doesn't work, or especially with inequalities, which is slightly playing with lower terms, this is a lower term. The reason we can add it and not change the asymptote is because any lower term asymptotically won't matter. 
these things are still n squared asymptotically. Anything I put in here just going to help me with the math. It won't change the fact that asymptotically it's n squared. Yes. Uh, so that's a lovely proof. But I'm mm -hmm. just, I got one question. Uh, where did you get, I, I understand you introduced DM, but you never explained how did you come up with that? Like, why not? I read it in a book. What? <laughs> I read it in a book. But so My recommendation for what you're about to ask is to read a lot of algorithms books. <laughs> you get very good at it. Honestly. But like, I've read a lot of math books in my life. <laughs> and I've got extremely good at proofs because I've seen a lot of proofs in those books. But for me, I'm like, I don't know, like, where, where <laughs> would I come up with that? <laughs> my proof? I don't know any other method than reading a lot of proofs. <laughs> I, I, I know I can give you, you know, kind of like soft answers, like, okay, try harder, don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> but the truth is, you want to be good at math, you have to read a lot of math. I, I, you should remember the tricks, though. Once you read something, it's, make, it's a good idea to make a note somewhere, either in your mind or in your laptop or on a piece of paper. What did I just learn today? Here's a trick. If the induction doesn't work with n squared, it might work with n squared minus a lower term, and that won't affect the asymptote. Lower terms helps the math. There's other tricks like that that were in here on the board. Remember the telescoping idea for Sigis? That's a good one. You know, <coughs> the inequalities, that's another one with the, I remember that was in the recitation. So when you see math proofs, it's a good idea to make a note of, okay, what was the trick used in here? All right, so that's that. Let's play more with these things, right? Like this, um, <laughs> let, let's make another one. So we finally finished this one. Yes. We did the clean form, it's n squared, but also we did the induction proof both ways, upper bound and lower bound, and show that it's n squared. Um, let's write something here. How about P of n is P of n by 2 plus T of n by 4 plus n. It can easily happen with some modified version of binary search that does something. Emergency, you know, the building is on fire. I don't know, congratulations, you want some. <laughs> this could happen easily. Imagine some sort of binary search modified that does half of array and then a quarter on the other side of the array and then takes a linear time to combine the results together. Half of the array, quarter of the array, combine them together. Easily you can have an algorithm that works that way, right? What's the story here? Can anybody make a guess directly? What is this? N squared. N squared. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. N log n. N log n. Anybody else? If you have a guess. The guess is a guess, it's, that's what it is. I'm looking at it and I'm guessing. Of course, if you've seen a lot of recurrences, you make better guesses. N log n plus n? That's n log n. Because if you add two things, the, the bigger one also works, right? <coughs> Anybody has a guess here? N squared log n. So here's my take. How is this compared to merge sort? Just I want to make a guess. I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm not in a mood for math proofs. Just to make a guess. I'm thinking of merge sort. Merge sort is n plus t of n by two plus what? Anybody remembers merge sort? What is merge sort? T of n by two plus t of n by two plus n, right? So. Between the, let's call this not t, because we get confused, r. 
between those two, which one should be bigger? Looks bigger, right? Because it's the same, but instead of a quarter, it takes a half. All these functions are monotonically increasing. So a half would be more than a quarter. So then my immediate guess is that this is as compared to merge sort, smaller or higher. But could be equal. So how do I say at most merge sort? Big O of merge sort. I like that. Which is? That's how you make guesses. You compare with something that's close to it that you know how to do. If you're lucky, that, that, again, that's a guess. We, we haven't proved anything. I'm just looking at it. I say, that's a little bit off merge sort. Just a little bit. Because the t of n by 2, it happens, and it happens. It's just in here that's a little off. So first of all, it cannot be bigger than merge sort. That's it, n log n. Also, there is an obvious upper bound. So, sorry, lower bound. This thing is clearly bigger than what? N. Because N, N is right here. Right? So, so far, without no proofs at all, where am I with this thing? That's between N and N log N. Even that, I think, in practice, it's a pretty good result. Of course, we want to know is it N or N log N or which one is it. But to know between N and N log N, it's quite useful when you run your algorithm. It's better than guessing things like N squared log N. If N is a million, N and N log N are still reasonably close if N is a million. This is a million, this is 20 million. But N squared log N is a different beast when N is a million. It is way in the degree of quadrillions. So if I want, just in practice, to estimate the runtime of my algorithm, this is not a bad thing. Of course, it's not as good as a data bound. But it's a reasonable, OK, first cut, what do I think is going to happen with my computer? OK, so um, <coughs> this needs a proof. Do I need to prove that's at least 10? When I say obvious, I mean we don't need a proof. But you have to be very careful with this word obvious, because different <coughs> people have different levels of obviousness. Is this obvious or not? Is it at least n? Because it has an n in here. It's n plus something. So it can't be lower than n. So my question is about the upper bound. I know it's n log n. Either I can try to prove the upper bound being n, and in this case, I don't need to prove the lower bound, or I prove the lower bound n log n, and then I have the merge sort as an upper bound, right? If if I choose, if I believe this is a linear thing, then I only need to prove the upper bound, lower bound is n. If I believe it's kind of n log n, I have the upper bound, I need to prove the lower bound. I think it's a linear. I think it's like this. Yes. The of n. I already have the lower bound, so which one I need? If I guess it's linear. I already have the lower bound, so I'm going to prove upper bound. This is upper bound. So what's my induction step? <coughs> Looking at the recurrence, what do I need to prove this? The end result is going to be Cn. But what, what this is going to come from? T of n, how do I write this for? the previous terms. It's going to be 1 of t of n by 2 is y. So I want an induction step that ends up with t of n smaller than cn. What do you think is going to be the induction hypothesis here? I'm looking at my recurrence here. So anybody can tell me what should I put in the induction hypothesis? Yes. So t of n by 2 is going to be equal to c n by 2? Yeah. How did I pick those two in particular? Clearly strong induction, right? How did I pick those two? I look at my recurrence and I'm like, how do you gonna deal with new customer in relationship with the old customers? You need n by two and n by four. That's how we're gonna deal with it. And out of that, I wanna prove t 
quantity of f. The same principle like before, but I need two guys because my recurrence depends on two terms. Strong induction. It's going to happen in the quiz more. Strong induction. Everybody knows that, right? Strong induction, of which induction, with all kinds of things. Uh, okay, well, let's try the proof. A am I sure here that this is going to work out? Do I have a strong evidence for this upper bound, or is it just a guess? It's a guess. This, once I do this, that's a super strong evidence. Unless my math is wrong, if I do the iterations, I know that. But in here, I just throw a random guess at it. Okay, well, let's try the proof. How do we do that? What's the relationship between the new customer and the old customers? Because there's more than one. Say it loud. Divided by two plus t of n by four plus n, right? Apply the induction hypothesis. Induction hypothesis. T of n by two is smaller than c n by two. T of n by four is c n by four plus n. And we want this to be what? The whole thing. What's our plan here to end up with? Yeah. Okay, well, let's see if that we can make this work out. Uh, let's multiply with four first to get rid of the noon. I hate denominators. So let's just <laughs> take them out first. 2cn plus cn plus 4n smaller than 4cn. Right? And now, uh, how many cns are around here? Let's move them on the other side. 4n smaller than 3cn. Sorry. 1 cn, because I had, let's say, 4 cn minus 3 cn, right? 4 cn minus 3 from here. Now, if I divide with n, I get 4 smaller than c, right? Because this is cn, that's 4n. <coughs> is, that, is that reasonable? Can I make this happen? I can. I can pick the constant, remember? I cannot change the constant. I can play with the constants like I was trying to do here. You know, pick the constant, then change your mind, upgrade the constant, make it bigger to make the inequality work. That you cannot do. But I can pick a constant, it's 4 or 4.5 or 5 or 10, whatever I want. So you can see how this I can make work for linear. Am I done at this point? Am, am I, I have both the upper bound and lower bound tight? I do. This is the upper bound here, and this is the lower bound. Therefore, this is done. This is a linear function. So the trick with recurrences, why you have to read a lot of math books, is that this is extremely tempted to intuitively to, to be close to Mertzor, right? I mean, how, how much more difference can it be in here between n by 2 and n by 4? It seems intuitively very close to Mertzor. In fact, Let's play a little bit with this guy. Let's try another one. T of n is T of n by 2, like Mertzor, plus T of, what is Mertzor here, n by 2? Let's try 1.999. Sorry, I mean 2.01. Just a little bit over Mertzor, right? OK, not, so you can put six zeros. What do you think this is going to be? How close is this to Mercer? Isn't that scary close to Mercer? Like how much difference can it be between n divided by 2.001? Remember Mercer? So what do you think this is gonna be? That's great. And, and <laughs> Like before, it can't be bigger than Mercer, so all that I said there applies. Clearly, it's upper bounded by Mercer. Mercer is a little bigger, and it's lower bound by linear. Well, try to make the same proof I did here for here, and you'll see because of this 2.0001, this will work for linear case. Again, it has an obvious lower bound, and you prove the same upper bound, but instead of n by 4, this is n by 2 over plus a little bit. When you make these calculations here, 
it's going to work out. The exercise, it's easy. It's really just that, replacing the 4 with 2.0001. The point is, don't get tricked. This in here and this in here have different asymptotes, although they look extremely similar. Okay. Um, what I want to uh, show you now is uh, something that I'm going to start the proof of a little bit intuitively. I'm not going to do rigorous proof, but the proof is in the notes. It's optional, and you can read the proof. How do you make those good guesses? Like, there is a theorem that allows you to make extremely good guesses in a lot of cases. Not all the cases, but a lot of cases. Specifically, all recurrences that look like this. Some coefficient. Is, is this one here that kind? 4 p of n by 2 plus n? Is that that sort of recurrence? Can I put an ABC to get exactly that recurrence? I mean this one here. case in the way. We can have an a is 4, B is 2, C is 1. How about merge sort? What do I need to put to get merge sort? A is 2, B is, C is. How about binary search? A is to get binary search. 1, B is. Is. So a lot, a lot of simple recurrences have this form. So there is a theorem called master theorem. For recurrences. That says there are three cases. <coughs> case C is more than log base B of A, then P of N is Obviously, these three cases cover the space, right? I mean, between two numbers, one is bigger, or the other one is bigger, or they equal. There's no other option here. So these are the cases. That we see. Now, this is the simplest version of master theorem. There are two much more complicated versions that cover not just n to the c, but all kind of functions in here. So when you do algorithms at the master's level, you're going to do a master theorem that is a t of n by b plus a function of n with restriction. So then you can do logarithms, square roots, and all kinds of other things, which don't fit nicely in n to the c. So there are other versions of master theorem. But this is the simple version. Now, uh, because I'm a mean professor, I'm going to subject you to the idea of a proof. And then I'm going to tell you, you can't use it. Okay. You cannot use master theorem in this course. Any homework, exam, quiz, say by master theorem, that's the result, zero points. Even though you know the proof, you cannot use master theorem. But what can you do with it? Make How can you make use of it, say, in the final exam? Make a guess. Make a guess. Nobody will ask you, How did you guess it? You don't have to say, I guess it with master theorem. In fact, you shouldn't say that. Because remember, it's not allowed. But if I make a guess right here, what case, take this one, what case is this? A is 2, B is 2, C is 
one. How one? What case is that one? A two, B two, C one. Is it this one? So A two, C two, B one. How much is log base B of A? That's a four, sorry. So let's do uh, A equals four, B equal two, C equal one. Log base B of A is how much? Two, C is one. So which case I'm in? I'm in this case? So then log base B of A is how much? I could have made a guess very easily with the master theorem. N squared. If I knew master theorem. So, so what's the idea? I'm going to start an idea of a proof here, and it's optional. Whoever wants to finish it, the proof is in the notes and in every algorithm book. Whoever doesn't want to finish, you don't have to. Okay. So, uh, you know what I'm going to do to make this start of a proof? I'm going to do the iteration method. T of n, I'll then start here because we're going to need a lot of space. <coughs> T of n is A T of n by B plus n to the C. What happens if I expand this again? I put my square brackets plus n to the C. What goes in here if I do the expansion in T of n by B? Again, I apply the same iterative idea, but not for T of n. Now the flower inside the T is n by B. What do I get? Somebody? See what I'm doing? I'm applying this on itself on T of n by B. So what do I get? A times T of n over B squared plus who's, who's at the power of C there? N over B. Remember, this is a TikTok process. You don't want to move to the next line until you, you clean your mess here. Right? So let's let's do that. How much is this? A squared B of N divided by B squared plus this is A N at B to the C. And I still have the N to the C, right? Not before. So now I go ahead and expand it again. I expand this one. So this is going to be a squared. What goes inside the parentheses if I expand t of n divided by b squared? A, because I apply the recurrence, but not in n, in n by b squared. A times t of n over b cubed plus what goes our power c here? n over b squared. I still have these terms. A n to the c by b to the c plus n to the c. Let us write it differently, slightly. n to the c here, and I have an a divided by b to the c. Now again, I apply the second part, which is cleaning up. a cube d of n by b cube plus what I've got here is n to the c a squared by uh, b squared to the c, I think, right? Plus, now I have the previous guys, n to the c a divided by b to the c plus n to the c. So these two were from before. This is n to the c at b to 2 to the c times n squared. That's it here. And this is a cube times the main part. Let's do it one more time. <coughs> now I'm expanding this one. What do I get? A t of right plus 
plus the ones I already have, n to the c, a squared divided by b squared to the c, plus n to the c, a divided by b to the c, plus n to the c. So remember cleaning up phase, a fourth, b at n by b fourth, plus, I think I'm going to write this as n to the c. I think every term is going to have an n to the c. I'm going to write this as a common factor. Because n to the c, n to the c, n to the c. And this one coming here has an n to the c. So this is n to the c common factor. Um, the first guy, it's a cube divided by b cube to the c. The one, it's a squared divided by b squared to the c. That's from here. The next one is a divided by b to the c plus 1. OK. Hands up, please with me. OK. Have we done enough iterations to be able to state the general pattern? Or not? If not, we'll do more. But at some point, we want to say general k after k iterations. So let's say this is k equal 4 is k equal 3 for a general k, how is this going to look like? a to the k, d of plus n to the c. Now what's going to be here? What's going to be here? a to the k minus 1 divided by b at k minus 1 at c, plus what's the next term in here? a to the k minus 2 divided at b to the k minus 2 at c, plus the last guys are a squared divided by b squared to the c, plus a divided by b to the c plus 1. What is this? This is a geometric series with base r equal how much? If I want to write this as r to the 0 plus r to the 1 plus r to the 2 plus r to the 3, r to the 4, fifth, what is the base of this geometric sequence? So how do I get this? This is r to the 0, r to the 1, r to the 2, r to the 3, up to r to the k minus 1. So geometric series, it's 0 plus r to the 1 plus plus r to the <coughs> k minus 1. But who is r to make this correct? How much? A divided by <coughs> If you pay attention, this is exactly a geometric series with this base. So then I know the formula of geometric series. How much is this? R to the k minus 1 divided by r minus 1, right? So the whole thing becomes a to the k, b to n by b to the k plus n to the c times rk minus 1 divided by r minus 1. That only works if r is not 1, because I can't divide it 0. If r is 1, this gets computed manually as what? How much is r to the 0 plus r to the 1 plus r to the k minus 1? r equal 1. It's k. It's k terms. So like before, I'll do last k. When is this going to finish? I need n by b to the k to be roughly 1 to get to a base case in here. That means k will have to be roughly who? Log space b to n, right? So if I put that in, I get a at log base b to the n, d of 1 because that's how I put it in to get 1 in here, plus n at c times, now this formula, if, uh, I replace r with a at b to the c. That's my r. k is it? log base b of n minus 1 divided by i to the b to the c. That's r minus 1 if i is not 1. So I've got my, my final result here. Now you can see why there are three cases. This is exactly r equal 1 case. 
the case that it's r equal 1, it's exactly a at b to the c equal 1. So that's going to happen when c is log base b of a. So in that case, I can't use the geometric series. I have to do <coughs> 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. In the other cases, what happens here, I have really two terms, this and this. Do you remember how theta works, the asymptote? If I have two functions, who controls the theta? The bigger one. Those are the two cases. If in one case, it's going to be this because that's bigger. In the other case, it's going to be that because that's bigger. I won't do these details here. The rest of this is in the notes. But I got you to how you think from here. If from here you say, I have a geometric series. One case it's one. That is that. And then I have the case of the base bigger than one and smaller than one. Smaller than one means it's convergent to a constant. Bigger than one it goes to infinity. You have to compute it exactly. And this is some machinations to get this. So if you want to talk about this Thursday at office hours, we can talk so much with you. Um, I think that's interesting mathematically. But for right now, it's extremely useful as making good guesses. Make sure it applies. You can easily get the recurrence. Can I apply it here, the master theorem? Nope. In that, that one here? The first one. Is that a master theorem thing? No. It is, but not this version. The two more complicated versions will cover this case. But that version that we did right here in class, it's not good for this. It's not A tier by B plus N to the C. I think that's what we want to do on recurrences. Uh, I'm putting my algorithm slides online, and you can see far more interesting recurrences here in proofs if you want to. For that uh, recurrence up there where you have t to the n by 2 plus t to the n by 4, could you split that up into two recurrences, like t to the n by 2 plus 1 half n plus t to the n by 4 plus 1 half n, apply master to both, and then like figure out which one dominates? No. I can't, if, we, if it's a sum of two, that's what you want, a sum of two, yeah. you can apply the master theorem. What you can do is to create an upper bound. This is, a, this is an upper bound, right? The lower bound would be, uh, say, b to the n or l to the n is l of n by 2 plus n. This is clearly a lower bound, right? Okay. Now I can apply the master theorem separately to both upper bound and lower bound, and I get what upper bound is, that would be n, n log n. I get what lower bound be, be, this would be my master theorem n, and now I know it's between n and log n. Uh, you may be able to do this, get the same asymptote. In here we, we don't get the same asymptote, because it's a tricky example, but if you get the same asymptote, then that's it. Uh, you can't do it with the sum. Okay. Let me show you another recurrence here, a very important one. But this one is not an order of growth example. This is an exact recurrence. Recurrent definition, I think everybody's seen it already. Um, Fn is f of n minus 1 um, plus f of n minus 2. Sometimes I'm going to write Fn is f of n minus 1 plus Fn minus 2. I'm, I'm going to use it like a sequence notation. I mean the same exact thing either in functional notation or sequence notation. Uh, and we have a base. Base is given. In most of these recurrence runtimes, base is not important. How much is t of 1? t of 1 doesn't matter. It's a constant. In here, we have an exact base. f0 is 0. f1 is 1. So that's the base. And from here, we can compute the other numbers. f2, f3, f4, f5, f6, f7, 
of eight, nine, ten, so on and so forth. So how much is F2? The rule is add the previous two numbers, right? Previous two values. So if it's zero, one, how much is this? One. Next one? Two. Next one? Next one? This is a well-defined exact recurrence because I have a base. Like you can put every single value exact. It's not just, I can ask the order of growth. The first question I have is, what is Fn theta of? Is it growing like what? Can anybody make a guess here? I guess it's a guess. Can you look at it intelligently and say, huh, I think it's like that. Asymptotically. How does this function grow? Yes. 2 to the n. 2 to the n. I think he's, what he has in mind is like 2 to the n <laughs> is the sum of two previous ones. Like 2, it's not 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n minus 2, but it's 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n minus 1, right? So the exponential as comparison. 2 to the n is 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n minus 1. This is the previous term doubled. Fibonacci is a little less than that because it's not the previous term doubled. It's the previous term plus the previous previous term. This would be smaller than this. Fn minus 2 is smaller than Fn minus 1. So it, this is definitely smaller than 2 Fn minus 1. So 2 to the n, I think, is an upper bound. But it may not be exactly 2 to the n. Maybe it's a little lower. Very good. So how do we deal with this? How do I find the asymptote of this function? I can try it. Uh, uh, here's an idea. Since it's exact, I can plot it in MATLAB up to like you know, uh, you know 3,000 values and see the actual curve. And I already have a sense that it's like exponential, right? Maybe not 2 to the n, because I, I hope everybody follow me here. 2 to the n is double the previous value. This function is not double the previous value, because it's smaller than 2 of the previous values. So maybe it's less than 2 to the n. How would I think about this? I have an idea. This is another trick in the category of write down the trick. Okay. So we don't lose it when we see it. Yes. Exponential. I mean, that's not very creative, right? How do I know exponential? Well, I already got 2 to the n. So I just said, maybe it's exponential, but not 2 to the n. Maybe a little less a to the n where a is less than 2. That's my guess, that if it's exponential, the base would be less than 2. Again, why is that? 2 to the n seems to me like a bigger function. It doubles the previous number. <coughs> Fibonacci don't double the previous number. Is 21 the double of 13? No, it's less. 55 double of 34? It's less, right? So because it's less, 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 I think it's less than 2 to the n. But the exponential guess comes from here. It looks reasonably close to think it's exponential. Now, let's play out my guess here. If a, if Fibonacci number will be exactly a to the n, what would that mean if this is true? Of course, it's not true. But let's say if it's true, what then? I'm trying to play out on the scrap paper here to just show you how I think about this. We'll get the guess, and then we'll make some induction proofs about it. But how do I get to that guess, playing it out until I get some interesting guess? Here's what I'm saying. Well, if this is true, what does it mean Fn is Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2? That's the same as a at n has to be a at n minus 1 plus a at n minus 2, right? 
if fn is a to the n, fn minus 1 is a to the n, this is n minus 2. If this is true, I'm not hoping to be exactly true. I'm just playing it out asymptotically. Well, that means what? I can divide the whole thing by a at n minus 2, right? So I get a squared equal a plus 1. I can solve to find a from here, right? You can solve a quadratic equation to find a. This is the Fibonacci generated function. We don't have time to talk about generative functions. Moving everything on the left side, a squared minus a minus 1 in x like looks like a function. That's the Fibonacci sequence generating function. And then um, I want to solve this. I, I forgot the formula of minus b a squared under square root or something. I forgot how to solve quadratic equations. So I have here a very elementary solution. If I want to set a squared minus a minus 1 equals 0, um, here's what I have. It's a squared minus 2 1 half a plus 1 fourth minus 5 fourth equals a. Is that true? a squared is a squared. 2 1 2 is a um, plus 1 fourth. I put that on purpose here. But because I only have 1, I have to take out. All I have is a minus 1. I added the 1 fourth. I have to take out the 1 and the 1 fourth. The reason I'm solving equations this way, actually I do that all the time because I can't remember that square root formula, is that you want this to be a square. The reason I put this one fourth here, I keep the terms that I have, a squared, two, one half a, you always keep that, and you put here enough to make this a square. So what square is this? It's a a minus b, everything square formula. a minus one half, Square. It's a squared, it's a squared. One half squared, it's a one fourth. And two, one two minus a, it's in here, in the middle, that's square. It's five fourth. So now, continuing here, a minus one half, it's either plus square root of 5 fourth or minus square root of 5 fourth, right? Because to have a square equal 5 fourth, the inside the square has to be either the square root or minus the square root of that. That's the only two values that if you square them, you get 5 fourth. So then A uh, has to be either square root of 5 by 2 plus one half or minus square root of five by two plus one half. This value here, it's called, I'm gonna put the Greek notation because that's what all the books use here. It's called phi. This is phi, and this value here, it's called c, and those are complement numbers as far as the solving this equation goes. So those are the roots, the two solutions for this equation, and I have phi square root of 5 by 2. I took the 2 from the square root of 4 here, plus 1 half because I had the 1 half, or minus that one, plus 1 half. Excuse my arithmetics here. I forgot how to solve the quadratic equation, and I don't have it here. So, but you can do the formula, and you get the same number. Um, so, OK. Here's some interesting relation between those two guys. Um, Let's put some relations here. P plus C, you can try this as exercises. Divide by 2, that's 1 half. Uh, P 
e plus c they sum up to one. Um, and uh, e minus one is one over c. Same for c. C minus one is uh, one over c. <coughs> And the final one is because they are roots of this equation, they have to satisfy phi squared is phi plus one, and c squared is c plus one, because they satisfy this equation. So you can do very simple arithmetic to prove these formulas about these two numbers. And now, here is my theorem about not the order of growth but the exact solution to Fibonacci numbers, the close form. Theorem. The Fibonacci number is Pn minus Cn C to the n divided by P. Like with all induction or recurrences, what do you think I'm going to get? Which, which facts I'm going to need to use here to imply this? Who do you think as previous things are going to be used here? We always look at the recurrence because we're going to ask, how is the new customer relating to the old customers? Who are the old customers so I can write this relation? Yes. N minus 1 and N minus 2. Sorry, I pointed to the wrong figure, but say it loud, loud. Say it again. Wait, me or something? You, you. F of N minus 1. But how do I write it? Uh, P or the same thing, but with N minus 1 everywhere. <laughs> right. Top. Over the bottom, it's the same. And then for f of n minus 2, replace the n with n minus 2. Same one. Right? If this is true for the n minus 1 and n minus 2, then I'm going to prove it's true for n. The reason I pick those particular dice is because the recurrence is in n minus 1 and n minus 2. <coughs> well, so let's do the proof. How much is fn? Of course, that's the new customer relates to the previous customers. Right? Well, let's apply the induction part. This is a very simple proof. How do I do that? This is P at n minus 1 plus C at n minus 1 divided by P minus C. That's the first one plus p at n minus 2 plus c at n minus 2 divided by p minus c. <coughs> p minus c I'm going to need, and it's a common denominator. doesn't bother me. I just put it on the side as the common denominator. So this is everything divided by p minus c here. Since I'm going to need it, I'm not going to worry about it. It's kind of like outside. Let's group the, these two guys. Um, P at n minus 1 plus P at n minus 2 it's minus. We have it with minus. Minus C at n minus 1. Um, plus c at n minus 2, because right? minus this, minus that, is minus their sum. <coughs> now, how much is this if I do a common factor? p at n minus 2 times 1 plus p minus c at n minus 2 times 1 plus c divided by p c. And now, 1 plus p is p 
squared. So that's p at n minus 2 times p squared minus c at n minus 2 times c squared divided by p minus c. That's, of course, p at n. That's what I wanted to go right. Now, what about base cases? Try n equals 0. This f0 is supposed to be phi at 0 minus c at 0 divided by phi minus c. Is that true? How much is f0? Zero. How much is phi at zero minus c at zero? Zero. How about n equal one? F one is supposed to be one, and that's supposed to be phi minus c divided by phi minus c. Is that true? Phi minus c divided by phi minus c. Is that one? You can do more if you want to play with it, but I think zero and one are enough. Because once I have zero and one verifying this formula. All of them follow the transactions there. Heads up who follow this derivation. Let's do a quick recap. This is the recurrence. New customer in relationship with all customers. Applying the action hypothesis, this becomes that. F minus 2 becomes that. I see now phi minus c at the denominator. That's going to stay like that until the end, so I don't have to worry about this phi minus c, because I need it at the very end. The question is the numerators. Phi at the minus 1, phi at the minus 2. Eventually, they're going to become phi at n. Phi at the minus 1 plus phi at the minus 2. If I write it as a common factor, it's phi at the minus 2, 1 plus phi. 1 plus phi, you're going to show at home that's phi squared. Actually, it's obvious because phi is the solution of this equation. So 1 plus phi must be phi squared. So that's why I get my phi squared times phi of the minus 2 is phi of n. The other guys, c at the minus 1, cx at the minus 2, same way. c at the minus 2, 1 plus c. c is the solution to that equation, so it's 6 squared. This becomes 0. So I've got from f n to minus 1, f to minus 2, I got to Yes? Wait, so the math trick that we did was we had our guess that it's, we first we know it's smaller than 2 the n. And we guess, okay, so if we have, if we change our base and we make it a to the n, then we solve for that quadratic, right? And then you found two values that you plug in and you did your reduction stuff. Is that all you did? Yeah, there is a step I cheated. You're right. The step I cheated is you found those two values of c. I think up to here was clear. Yeah. How did you come up with this? How come from the p and c? you come up with phi to the n minus c to the n divided by phi minus c. I mean, I knew it's an exponential. That was my guess. So I wanted to look like an exponential. And I knew the generative function has these solutions. The part that I skipped over is the whole theory of generative functions. If you solve the generative function for roots, then what is the general formula for the equation? See, I read so many math books. That's one of them, how to apply generative functions. So I got this guess. This looks very easy, right? Once somebody tells you this is the one to prove, you can try a lot of things that look like exponentials and relate to those values. But until you put your hands exactly on this formula, the induction proof won't work. If you try, for example, just phi to the n divided by phi, that seems like a reasonable thing to try, and it won't work. In fact, it will work, because you can see the induction proof will work phi of n <coughs> times 2 by phi will work out. What we won't work is the base cases. If you just have phi of n divided by phi, that's not going to be for a base case. Now, um, not to mention that phi of n divided by phi, it's not an integer. If you go for n equal 3, 4, 5, 6, you get real values that are very close to Fibonacci numbers. In fact, asymptotically, this is, if you look at the values, this is just phi at n. Uh, but they're not integers. You need exactly this formula to obtain integers. So if I'm to write this formula again with numbers, so you guys have it, I'm going to write the same formula, 1 plus square root of 5 uh, divided by 2 at n 
minus 1 minus square root of 5 divided by 2 by n divided by phi minus c, I think it's come down to square root of 5. So that is the closed form of Fibonacci numbers. Um, so you got to think yourself a little bit from a computer science perspective. Suppose somebody says, I have this uh, recurrence here. Task. Calculate fn. Procedurally as a function of n, you know. Let's write the program that if somebody gives an n, you produce the Fibonacci number. Here's a version of how to do that. And you can tell me if it's good or not. My function here, function f of n, is if n is 0, return 0. If n is 1, return 1. Else, return f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 1. Done. That's my function. Is that correct? Is that what you guys would do with racket, for example? It says, if you're in a base case, I know the value. If not, compute f n minus 1 and f n minus 2. This is recursive calls, right? And it's going to correct return the correct answer. Everybody can see this is a correct algorithm. What's the problem with this? It's slow. It's exponential. If you say n equal 100, how many calls are going to be made? At 100, I make 99 and 98. For 99, I make what calls? 98, 97. For 98, I make 97, 96. Now for 97, I'm going to make 96, 95. How many calls are being made here down to the base cases? An exponential number of calls. The runtime of this algorithm, it's exponential in average. Hands up, please. Because just the, the calls are simple, but the number of calls is gigantic. That's my take on racket, just to. <laughs> How about this? How fast is for a computer to execute this? Give you n, calculate this, and that. How fast is this? Assuming I have a coprocessor, which all ships now since like 2003, every single Intel processor has a math coprocessor built in it, it can do the exponential almost in constant time. Almost. It has a very good approximation for the exponential down to the seven decimal that could be run for all practical purposes that for n smaller than a million in constant time. Now, it's not exactly constant. Exponentials cannot be solved exactly in constant time, no matter what. But the, for all practical purposes, doing this will feel like a constant time. So then if that's true, how long is it going to take to execute to compute this value? Constant. See where math helps? Somebody who doesn't know how to solve the Fibonacci numbers will do an exponential time algorithm. Somebody who knows generative functions and produces this value will do it instantly. In between, there are all kinds of algorithms. I have an algorithm in my notes that I'm going to put online that does it in linear time. Instead of doing this, can I do it in linear time? Without knowing how to solve, I'm just master at algorithms. How do I compute f of n? Yes. Uh, you start at the base cases and just work about computing. f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1, and then? And then f of 2 is? 4, i equal 2 to n. Yeah. fi is fi minus 1 plus fi minus 2, and at the very end, return f of n. Is that computing the right thing? Start base cases, computing everything, be based on previous computations. At any point, I'll have the previous values computed, so I can do that. How long is this going to take? There is no recursive call here. This is Fibonacci on n. F is an array. 
This is not a recursive call. It's just use the previous value computed in that array. It's filling up the array one by one. How many loops are going to be executed here? How much is the effort in each loop, each iteration? Don't get confused by this. This is not a recursive call. It's a look in the array. I have a global array F. And in that array, I've computed the previous values. And I add up the previous values. That's what's going on here. It's not calling a function recursive. Okay? You think of this as an array. I start with those two values. Next step, I add the previous two. Next step, I add the previous two. Next step, I add the previous two, so on and so forth, until I fill up the array up to n. I'm not calling a recursive function. How long is this going to take? That's another take I have on Rocket. Well, how stuff works normally in versus in Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, linear time. And I have one that's even better than linear. That has to do with matrices. That's the logarithm time. So I can do Fibonacci naively with recursive call in exponential time. This is going to be called very important in computer science in algorithms course, dynamic programming using a computation based on the values just computed before, dynamic programming. Very, very useful thing to know. Then I can do it logarithm times with matrices. I'm not going to show you that. You're going to see it in slides if you, if you look online. Or if I know a lot of math, I can do it in constant time because I get the closed form solution for Fibonacci, and then I'm done. That can be computed. Now, let me show you some applications of Fibonacci numbers. That's the theory. So how does this stuff play out? Where do I need it? Here's an application that has to do with geometry. Here's how you can think of Fibonacci numbers. Here's a, a square of side one. <coughs> if I put next to it a square of side one, what's the side here now? Make that a square. Now, what's this side here? Make that a square. That's not a square. Now, what is this side? So if you make that a square, I'm going to run out of space. Because I went to the wrong direction. Now, what's this side here? And what's this side here? So if you draw a bunch of squares like this, you get all the Fibonacci numbers. Because every number is the sum of the previous two. 5 is 2 plus 3. This square here is 8, it's 3 plus 5. This square here, it's 5 plus 8 aside. And you get a bunch of squares that all play to each other. This golden ratio, phi, golden ratio. Uh, I think it's about 1.68. It's less than 2, like we said. It's exactly the ratio of printing. Remember the pages? A4, A5, so on and so forth, the printing sizes. If you put two of those next to each other, you get the next size. And then you put two of those next to each other, you get the next size. The printing sizes, if you look at the paper sizes, follow the golden ratio, the ratio between this side of the paper and this side of the paper. It's all the same proportion, 1.68. Here's another application of Fibonacci numbers. Um, I'm going back to the second week of classes. I want a byte that's how many bits? Eight bits. does not contain consecutive ones. So I want to know how many bytes can I put here. The only restriction, if I don't have any restriction, how many bytes are there? If I fill it with zero and ones, how many different bytes can I get? Back to the second week of classes. 2 to the 8, right? But now I'm putting a restrictions. Every time you put a 1, 
you can't put another one right next to it. Clearly, that's less than 2 to the 8, right? it's average restriction. So here's how I can think about this problem. I can do it brute force. I want to do brute force. I'll look at this byte and say, um, number of strings with valid with n bits is f n plus 2 is the Fibonacci number. Here's how I'm going to think of that. I use a little bit of an induction mechanism. I won't call it induction. It's like a recursion. This, this is a particular case for um, S. This is S8. How many of these strings you have with eight characters? I'll do generally SM. I'll say, you look at a string like that, and you say, um, here's my string. This is the first spot, and this is the rest. So this is SN. The first spot can be what? Zero or one, right? If this is a zero, I have another case where I do the same thing. This is a one. What's going to happen here if this is a zero? Can I put anything I want valid? So if this is a zero, the first one, this is a counting problem. How many possibilities I have here? This is n minus 1 bits, right? What is the number of valid strings on n minus 1 bits? It has to be valid. It's not 2 to the n minus 1. That's all of them. It's a recursive thinking here. If I put a 0, this is all the valid for n minus 1 bits. How many are those? S n minus 1. Any valid string of n minus 1 bits, you can put a 0 in the front, and it's valid now for n. If I put a 1 here, can I say this is s n minus 1? Any, any string in here is still valid? No, because some of these strings start with 1. But what can I do here? If this is the one, then this, the next one has to be a zero. zero. And the rest is, this is the second, the rest is the rest n minus 2. Now, can I put anything valid in here, s n minus 2? That's s n minus 2. Is this a sum rule? Are those disjoint cases? Anything that starts with 0 is not going to be the same like something that starts with 1. So I count two different things. The strings that count to 0, that's s n minus 1. The strings that start with 1, 0, that's s n minus 2 of them. So what do I have? Sn is Sn minus 1 plus Sn minus 2. Clearly, that's going to lead to Fibonacci numbers. It's the same recursion. I mean, I have to verify the base cases. <laughs> verify the base. You should know that the same exact recursion with a different base, suppose I don't start from F0 and F1. I start from a different base. Would have the same asymptotic behavior. But would be different values because if I start with say one and three, the string won't be those values. I have one, three, the next one will be four, the next one will be seven, so on and so forth. But asymptotically, it's gonna be the same exact phi to the end. Because the behavior is the same. So if I verify the base here, I'm gonna get exactly the one values. That was a question. I've, I've seen the handout. So here's an application for Fibonacci numbers. This kind of thing, if I show it to you the first, second week of counting, you would have done it brute force, and you get the gigantic table, like this. Here's all the possibilities. You get a 0, you get a 1, then you get a 1, then you get a 0, then all of that up to n, 8 cases. In here, you can see a much more general approach. I'm thinking recursively, there's two cases. Either start with 0 or 1, 0, and then deal with the rest. That's also dynamic programming. That's going to become in your algorithm class, this kind of thinking, dynamic programming. And the recursion you get, very easy to solve with a linear <coughs> program if you don't know generative functions to do exactly. 
that's usually very accepted in academia to do it this way, because linear time is not that. When you go to production, you work for Google, you're probably going to be expected to do something like this. Yes? So is S of 1 in this case 2 because there's one bit and you have two options? I think so. I think you get exactly the Fibonacci numbers. I think in here, Sn is Fn plus 2. Starts exactly the Fibonacci sequence, oh, I see. but from shifted a little bit. Okay. Okay. Here's, I have some exercises in mind for the final related to Fibonacci numbers. Let's see. Exercises. Fibonacci. Prove that P to the N is Fn P plus Fn minus 1 by induction. study so far? That would be nice. Uh, and the last one, order, that's like the one in the meter. Order the compositions of n into a sum of 1 plus 2. The number of order decompositions is fn plus 1. What I mean by this is n is equal 5, I can write it 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, right? Or I can write it 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2. Or I can write it 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 ordered. So 2 matters where it is. Or I can write it as 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. 2 plus 2 plus 1. 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1. So for the number of ways you can write 5 with 1 and 2 in order, it's Fibonacci number n plus one. So there you go, one, two, three, four. Four beautiful exercises. I'm actually trying to do this. We're done with the currencies. Oh, one more thing. Anybody looked at the beautiful problem six in this homework? It seems so good. Oh, yeah. What do you think about that? So let's figure out this hours today. I don't know. Deal with it. Okay. 